Bibles to Matthew 2, if you would. Let's stand in honor of God's Word. Matthew 2, 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose. We've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. From, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and being warned in a dream... Not to return to Herod, they de- not to return to Herod. They departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we need you uh, to, by your Spirit, help us to see uh, this passage with uh, fresh eyes. There's no new truth that's showing up today, but what we know is that your Word applies in new ways. Maybe we hadn't seen something before. But Lord, as as we see this, I pray that you would remind us who you are. You remind us who we are. And Lord, that this would be a light for our lives, a path for what we need to do, uh, not just a, a story uh, that happened years ago, that we would see how it directly impacts our lives today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. What do you seek? What do you seek? If someone were to press you in your life and ask you, what do you seek? Let me tell you, you're seeking something. Everyone here is. Uh, you're looking for something, and it could be either in a job or a particular quality of life or a particular thing for your life. There are lots of things that you're seeking. On this day, uh, and these uh, men's lives, uh, they're seeking the Messiah. And what you need to know about what's going on here, Matthew's gospel, he's writing to, to say that this is the primest king, that Jesus was anticipated from a long time ago. And what's kind of wild about this particular context is these are Gentiles. These are not Jewish people. The people who you think should be coming and seeking the king. They're, it's Gentiles. It's not the Jews who are from the land. And so what we're going to look at just really quickly is this idea that there are three really responses to Jesus in that day that are, that are still going on today. So three responses to Jesus. Uh, years ago, I was in Panama, uh, and uh, quite a few now, uh, and I was in a rural area, and I remember seeing the sky uh, and the stars like I'd never seen before. I've been in the country. I mean, I know the difference between you know city viewing. In fact, last night I looked up and saw one star, grand total. That's it. I was like, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the reminder that we're in the city area uh, and clouds and such. But in Panama this day, I remember walking just kind of in awe that I could see so much, so many stars. These people uh, are, they, they study the stars, and they're kind of spiritual people too. They've been, probably they've heard from Jewish exiles about a promised king who's coming. And so there's this awareness, and it's not all entirely clear exactly how, whether it's an angel or a star, but these people are paying attention and abnormally conscious that, the, that Christ has actually come. And so they are seeking they're willing to leave, we think, probably Babylon's, Babylon's a good guess of where these guys are from. Uh, but if not, they came from a long ways. But you can imagine traveling 800 miles on ancient terrain to go anywhere, to do anything at all. 800 miles, period. And imagine, there's not car, <laughs> transportation, but a different thing. Things to know is, is a lot of caricatures that you think about, like in manger scenes and such, aren't always perfectly accurate, just so you know. There's, it's not like, for one, in this particular context, we think it was a couple years later um, of when this is happening. Uh, also, it wasn't just three people. Uh, people will take like kind of the gifts that have been given, and they'll pan out to that, and like, there must be three exact gifts. Like, have you ever given more than one gift? And like, or could you have been at a gathering where three gifts were given and there were 30 of you? So really, it, you know what I'm saying? Like you can't, it's, it's projection to say that. So I think what I want to encourage you is we're looking at a passage that may be familiar to you. 
that you go back and say, well, what, is actually, what has God actually said? And just kind of allow yourself to stand on what he has said and don't overclaim on anything he hasn't said. So the first thing I want you to see is there are three, three responses to Jesus. And the first one, curiously, is paranoia. It's hostility. Uh, look at verses 1 through 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. All right, so the context here, it says the the days of Herod the king. Now, who is Herod? Herod the Great was a a really influential builder. He was kind of an under king. The the Romans had put him in power, but he'd he'd kind of be called king of the Jews of sorts. But he was really a, a jerk, is the nicest way to say it. Uh, he killed uh, his own, one of his ten wives. He killed three of his sons, hundreds of his supporters. When you think of uh, King Henry VIII, you know, that's in, in English history, you think of uh, you know, another jerk uh, who had power. And uh, that's what's going on. This guy is not a particularly nice guy, and yet he's, he kind of could be termed in the day and in the context the king of the Jews. And so it's very interesting that God... Uh, it continues to reference Matthew highlights king the king he was king because you're going to see this huge contrast between the human positioned king a guy who Rome put in place to just kind of keep things in order uh, verse and actually he built uh, he rebuilt the temple you can go into Caesarea today I've been to a place that were the remains of one of his palaces he was a very active builder he was very good at building. Uh, some of the stuff still, a lot of his stuff still exists because he was he just built so many things. This guy in particular. But what's interesting is these Jesus. He's born in Bethlehem in Judea. Je- Bethlehem is the city of David, right? We've talked about that uh, in earlier in, in Matthew. That it's from David's line that this king is going to come. It's in the days of Herod the king, and what that really means is it's an era. Uh, which which, which fear is is part of what's going on here. And it's very interesting that these wise men come to Jerusalem because they think, all right, the king of the Jews will be in Jerusalem. That makes a lot of sense. And they come and they say, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? So Herod was king right around Jesus' lifetime specifically. He's an Edomite. He's kind of half Jewish. He's, he's He's not a full Jew. And so when they come and they say, um, where is the one who's been born king? He didn't get this by, by delegation. He was born into it. And you know there's a difference, right? Especially in this time of the thought of being born the king. So this, all these words would have made Herod nuts because he was already a paranoid king. He, was, he would go after his own family, his own sons, for any, th- any threat to his kingdom. And so God, I don't think it's an accident at all that he is putting up human king versus his king. And, and you see a tyrant versus a humble one who lays down his life. Here it takes lives. Jesus lays down his life. So there's this huge contrast. But what's wild is wise men come to Jerusalem, and they're not from there. They're not Jewish. And it's this picture of what God is showing us is that he has a heart for the nations. It's all over. If you start to look, you'll start to see how often the language of the nations it shows up. And so the fact that these are wise men from the east, they're not, not Jews, it's not an accident. They came to Jerusalem. They're asking for the one who's born uh, king of the Jews. And you can imagine Herod's really anger. If he would kill his son, do you, do you really think <laughs> anyone is not game at this point? And that's exactly who he is. Uh, the true king of the Jews is, is, is already been born. And they're here to see him. Unlike the king of the Jerusalem palace, the little family could trace their lineage all the way back to Israel's king David. So this unknown people in Bethlehem, actually just a few miles from Jerusalem, um, they can trace their line to King David. Herod cannot. And so when they're asking for this born king, this would have made him crazy mad. Uh, next, they say, specifically, they say that we saw his star. So again, we don't know. I said this earlier, whether it's like an angel appeared or whether the, just the stars themselves, there was some kind of shift. There are different theories on this. They're, they're all kind of guessing, if I, w- I would just say it like that. But whatever the case is, these guys were so convinced that they travel hundreds of miles in ancient terrain to get to him. Have you ever sought anything that would cost you like that? They're, they're coming actively, and they want to see this king. 
We've come, look what it says, that we've come to worship him. How crazy the thought that this guy Herod would want to really kill this other king. And yet these guys, who aren't from Jewish background, are here to worship him. Huge contrast. One writer says this, we, we read of no greater faith than this in the whole volume of the Bible. These guys literally hear, or they believe, and they see, they go, this is, they've maybe heard, again, prophecies of one who's coming out of Israel, this particular kind of thing. There's a prophecy in, in Micah, specifically, uh, and it probably from exiles, they would have heard about this, but nonetheless, they literally travel a long ways to meet him, and they're convinced he's here. Look at verses 3 through 4 now. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And then it continues, and all of Jerusalem with him. Why? Because he was a tyrant. And now he's mad. He's really mad. Uh, and assembling, he says, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So now he's interested, where is this Christ, this, this anointed king, this promised king, anticipated king, who would they thought for sure would overthrow Rome and the oppression. He'll do much more than that for sure. Like, where is he at? What, where, what do the prophecies say about his arrival? He's paranoid. This other king has a birthright. So he assembles all the chief priests and scribes. He inquires where the Christ will be born. At first, it's public. Now, you need to get, in this time, there are famous uh, rabbis, including Hillel and Shammai. You may have heard those names if you know anything about Jewish stuff. They would have been among these people. He literally is a, an influential person who feels the threat of another king. And so he has the ability to say, you will come, and you will come, and you will come, and you're going to tell me what the deal is. And so they would have, this would have not been uh, the leftover people. This would be the big people. Tell us where he's coming. Because ultimately, verse 13, we won't get that today, he's, he's going to search to destroy the kid. Because he, he, again, he's willing to do that with his own sons. He, he protects his throne at all costs. So the first real response to Jesus, it's not fully teased out yet in this context, but is hostility. He hears of this other king, and, and he has no interest in sharing his throne, and hostility is his response. There are a few things to see here in the response. First, non-Jews um, worship him, and in, in Jews in this context are not. Second, uh, Emmanuel is God with us. The fact that he's been born... That's already talked about. He is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The baby who was born was not just a man. He was fully God, fully man. And he is here. He's humble. Um, the Herod is a human-appointed king. Jesus is God's king. God-appointed, long-expected. This king would ultimately give his life for me and for you. Herod would never. He will exchange your life for his. Jesus exchanges his life for ours. It's a totally different kind of king. I think a lot, another important thing to, to notice about hostility is I, 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 the more I've kind of walked and talked with people, the more I've noticed people tend to think the reason they're rejecting Jesus is because there's not enough reason. There's not enough information. There's not enough this. There's not enough that. The more I've walked with people, the more I'm like, no, it's a morality problem. Uh, there, morality is a part, moral unbelief. When you don't, some people don't want him to exist. Do you know that? You might, you might, a lot of people, you say, hey, you need Jesus. Uh, they're like, I don't. <laughs> and like, they don't think they need him. Or they think there's not enough reason to believe anyways. And I'm telling you, there's a moral facet of unbelief. I've told you all this a bunch uh, from C.S. Lewis study things. C.S. Lewis was an atheist. And I told someone this the other day, so I'll say it again. Why not? Uh, C.S. Lewis thought, he said this as an atheist. He said, Christianity is, is a myth like so many others. And he said, it's not even the best one. That was what C.S. Lewis said as an atheist. Later in his life, he describes himself sitting in Modlin College in Oxford, and he discusses the fact that he felt this, the approach of one he so wanted not to meet. I'll say that again. He felt like this approach, every time he said, every time he took his head up from his studies, every time he was no longer distracted, he would feel the, the approach of one he so wanted not to meet. And then ultimately, he surrendered to him and believed that he existed as God. And then later, he became a Christian. But what I want to tell you is, it wasn't because of, of, of rationale alone. He didn't want God to exist. So it's worth you knowing that sometimes people just don't want him to be. So don't be confused. I'm like, oh, I don't believe for this or that. You're like, eh, maybe. Maybe it's because you don't want him to be. 
Here's why. Again, a guy who was influential in my life, atheist, became a Christian. He knew that if Jesus really is everything that Scripture says he is, that he would give an account for his life, and he could not live like he was. So that he had reason to reject him, for him not to be. Because if he's real, then I'm not king. And this is Herod. He, he doesn't want to bow to him. He's hostile to him. So first point, three responses to Jesus. One is hostility. The second one is, is apathy. Apathy. Look at verses 5 through 6. Uh, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. So again, they're asking, uh, he's asked uh, the scribes, these, these, these high priests, and he's saying, where, where is the, the Christ to come from? He says, um, I told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, again, this is Micah 5.2, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So they tell him, where is the, where is the Messiah supposed to come from? And their answer is, um, they, they know where he's supposed to come from. So it's not a content issue. That the leaders knew where the Messiah was to come from. And then they say this, it is written that Bethlehem in Judah, in Judah, a ruler is coming. A ruler who will shepherd his people. There's this promise hundreds of years before he's here that this one is coming. And what's wild is these people know the promises, okay? They know the promises. And by the way, you probably know a lot of promises that God has made. But it was, it was distant to them. This didn't cause them to change. They didn't change their lives. They didn't say, let's cancel all plans and go to Bethlehem. That's not what they do. They basically tell these people who have left their country to find him. Uh, they, they tell, actually, well, really, Herod. And, and they're like, they just go on with their business. Like, they don't care, really. The conviction that compelled these Gentiles to travel miles and miles was not enough to move these scholars to see for themselves that there's a promised king. They just don't do anything. So the response is apathy. Uh, One person writes this, I think it's good. The wise men were saying, we believe the king of the Jews has been born. We don't know where, but wherever he is, we want to go to reverence him. The religious leaders were saying, we know where Messiah will be born, but we we have no intention of going there. Any religious leader worth his salt should have said Bethlehem is, the, is only a few miles away. Maybe six, by the way. Only six, you know, basically six miles away. We'll take you. Let's go together. That's what they should have said. But the prophecy of Micah made no more impact on them than if they have solved the morning newspaper crossword puzzle or the daily Sudoku. They answered Harris' question, packed up the scroll of Micah in its sacred container and went home. It is possible to know the Bible well, and yet be tone deaf to its message. And this is a threat to us, okay? This is a threat to church people, is to know a whole lot of stuff, and that it not change anything in our lives, it not shape anything about our lives. There is no conforming to, hey, there's this king <laughs> who, who reigns, and who I can know, and who loves me, and he makes no impact in our lives. That is a real threat to church people. It's not just a threat to church people, it's a threat to, to people, <laughs> In, in what, certainly in, in places of affluence, people don't care. If you were to say, hey, you need a Savior, the answer would be something like, I don't really. I don't, I'm, I'm fine. I'm really good. I'll go to the hospital if I have illness. And the places I've noticed, when people like that start to go, uh, I need to start thinking about this, is honestly in the face of death. Because then the game is off. You know full well there's no more time. There's nothing else you can do. And now, for the first time, sometimes, not always, sometimes you'd never hear or never hear again, or quit listening. Um, you move to a place, you're like, wow, I need something that can stand here. But apathy is a threat. It is a threat to us. It's a big one. It's one of the biggest threats in the West, for sure. Distractions are a thing. It's so easy to be so distracted by every conceivable plan and pathway and agenda that you and I have that we have no regard for him. And yet we can, I think, learn from these, um, these wise men that they think it's worth leaving the comforts of their home and going to find this one who's been promised. This is such an important challenge to us. Apathy is a threat to you, I promise you. 
If you don't feel it, it's because you are feeling it. <laughs> like you are literally apathetic. You either know, either you're living a revival, let me say it like that, or you stand in awe of him and you go, I, God doesn't need me, I need him. And you're grateful that you belong to him and you go, Lord, send me wherever you want, I'm yours. Or something else where we just are kind of like, yeah, you're kind of just comfortable with the promises and it doesn't really change your life. If Jesus isn't moving you, if he doesn't occasionally inconvenience your life, Something is probably, it's probably you. You're probably not listening because he inconveniences your life. He does. Part of the plan is dependence. Everyone say dependence. That means life will sometimes not be what we want it. It will be inconvenient. And if he's king, I have to adjust. And all of us know if you have a, a, a boss and you're a professional, they will inconvenience your life. If you're paid a certain amount, they're not asking. Like, they're like, this is what you will be doing. This is what we need. This is why we pay you. Right? That's it. So it's not really weird that someone would, would say there are things you should do. But this king is really good. And yet he really is a king. And in this day, apathy was a real threat to people who knew lots of promises. And God help us not to be like that. Totally capable. Everyone here in this room. Capable of knowing promises and it not changing anything. And this is a caution to us. The third response is worship. Worship. Look at verses 7 through 8. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. For when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's not what that means. <laughs> he is a liar. Uh, that's your short summary. Uh, Herod asks, look what he does. He says, he talks to them. By the way, they don't know. <laughs> they're like, I don't know what's going on here. They say, maybe, they, maybe they're wondering, I don't know. And he says, what time did the star appear? Now remember, they've come basically to Jerusalem, to the palace of Jerusalem. And they th- that makes sense, right? If you're looking for the king. This is where I would go for a king. Now, would you be looking? Let's go to the palace, find the king. He's not there. There is a king there. Uh, and, the, and he says, what time did the star appear? Now, what's happening is he's trying to track when, when was he born. Because he thinks when this star, when this star appeared, it has to correspond with his birth. So now he just wants to know what, when was this. Because he's trying to track when he was born for some framework. Now, I think this is an important thing to know. Long before Micah's prophecy of this one who is coming as his king, Genesis 3.15 talks about one who is in the line of, of Eve in Genesis 3.15. And it says that he will basically crush the serpent's head and the serpent will wound his heel. There's this promise longer before, before Micah, really, of one who is coming who will basically reverse the effects of the fall. This is underneath all of this. And so what we need to know is there's satanic pushback to his existence. Real, real satanic pushback. So on this day, Satan is also part of the game here. Uh, and, and he wants Jesus to die. And Herod wants Jesus to die. And what we know is he will not die until he lays down his life. But that's what's going on here. There's satanic pushback. Look at verses 9 through 10. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen, when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they, rejected, uh, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. So after listening to the king, they went on their way. The true king of the Jews was not in the Jerusalem palace. He was in Bethlehem, in a house. They came to rest or a place where Jesus was led. Now, here's the thing you need to know. Christmas cards will lay the star like over like the house, right there. Like, we don't, I'm not sure that's how that was. If they're looking at stars, it was probably high, you know. Okay, just so you know, but if they know the skies, and some people do, uh, they would know, they would have some kind of corresponding coordinates of where they are if it's just, if it's a thing. But I think what's worth noticing is it's cosmic. Jesus' arrival affects both human and cosmic stuff. So stars, literally, God has reached out to people hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, and they're coming into Jerusalem looking for him, for this, this newly born king. And cosmic stuff's going on. Not huge, explosive, where everyone's thinking everything about it, but he is, is, is declaring and showing that this is not just any king. The, the world is taking note, unseen. He's a cosmic king, he's a humble king, he's a global king. 
When they saw the star, it says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. These guys are finding what they've been seeking. The star, it, said, it seems that what happened was after they went and, and talked to Herod, maybe the star was on standby, I don't know what happened, but somehow uh, there's a shift and they're like, it appears again. In fact, they're excited. It's like new coordinates. I think if God does this in my life, sometimes you're like, hey, start walking that way. You're like, okay, we're, we're supposed to go this way. And, and, and it's like you, you, you are grateful when well, there's a reminder that you're going the right direction. And I think this is what's going on at some level. And they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. These Gentiles are overjoyed. Have you seen joy? Have you had joy in your life? I think of uh, a few things. I think of uh, re- this week, talking to someone who is, saw, understands that Jesus is the Savior, and was exceedingly joyful, contagiously so. I'm reminded of, of, of Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon. When he came to faith, he talked about like running and telling anything would listen to him. He says this, a uh, 15-year-old, he, it was like a snowstorm that landed him providentially and some uh, guest speaker who wasn't the normal preacher. It was like just a, hey, fill the spot. He can't get here. It's a Sunday and it's snowing. And it says this uh, Spurgeon, who was a, a really influential pastor, talks about this after he became a believer. He says this, and as the snow fell on my road home from the little house of prayer, I thought every snowflake talked with me and told of the pardon I found. For I, I was white as the driven snow through the grace of God. That he moved from a burdened soul, an uncomfortable soul, a person who knew he was lost, to knowing that Jesus had paid everything. And now he was forgiven. And he just wanted to tell anyone. I remember when it felt, what it felt like when I really surrendered to God. And there's a, a weight of knowing that all the stupid stuff you've done that really should rightly separate you from God forever is forgiven. And just, there's joy. Like this. Only more, I think. We know his name. We know his name. Uh, Spurgeon, when he got home, his mom, he was, he was 15, by the way, when he got saved, uh, he said, something wonderful has happened to you. Um, again, I've talked, I've, I keep telling this to different people. I don't know whether I was saved when I was seven or whether I was in college when it happened. Pretty dramatic stuff happened in college. So that makes me go, I don't know, maybe college. Um, but I remember telling one of my, my friends, I lived in Bogota, Colombia, and I remember going back to lots of people and saying, hey, I was confusing about what Christianity is. It is alive. I'm not sure I was. <laughs> like, my life didn't look like what it means to follow him. He really changed his lives. So I'm picking my friend up in Dulles. He was just going to stay with us for a few weeks. But I was like, I so regretted the picture I gave him about Jesus that I was like, I'm going to tell him within seconds of getting out of the airport, basically, and I did. Uh, and we're driving home to Centerville from Dulles, and I said, hey, I want to let you know Jesus has changed my life. He said, I already knew. That was his answer. He's a believer now. Not from that day. I don't know when. It was actually a lot of things started maybe happening there. I take and trust God's ability to reach your friends. I'm just saying. Uh, joy... When you can honestly, and you, everyone knows you're not cheating or baiting or, or doing fake stuff. When you just say, Jesus Christ saved my soul, and he continues to change me, your friends already know. Now, their response might be hostility. I mean, that's normal. Don't be bothered. But just remember, hostile people have become believers too. There you go. Uh, lots of them. So don't get freaked out by that. But he really does do this. But what could they do? They, they come, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. When's the last time you had that? That you stood in awe of God and joy is the byproduct of your life. That you knew you were loved by God, He knew everything about you, and you, were, you had joy. I think that's the plan for us, by the way. Matthew 2, 11 through 12, let's continue. And going into the house, look at what happens next. They saw the child. Again, we think he may have been two-ish. He's not, we don't think he's a baby at this point. He's with Mary's mother and says they fell down and worshipped him. Gentiles. Grown men who have resources come to this house and they bow down to him. Why? Then they opened their treasures and they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, 
they departed to their own country by another way. So notice first, they see the child. The, the promise that they'd heard at a distance is now being seen. The king is alive. He looked presumably Middle Eastern, uh, and, and he, they enter this house, and they see this lady who shouldn't be having kids. You don't have kids because you have not been married like that, and, and you have a child, and here he is. And what we know is his name is, is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He is this promised king. He's been anticipated a long time, and he's literally in this house. And they bow down to him. They fell down, and they worship him. Grown men fall down before a young child in awe. Joseph's dream, you know, his concern that my wife has been unfaithful to me, surely this would have been encouraging to him. <laughs> this isn't a local. They don't know us. These aren't our people. You know, they're, they're in, the, in, in there saying, look, you know, there's cosmic stuff that sent us here. And now they're bowing down to the guy you're entrusted to raise. And, and it was good. They worship him. Don't be afraid to take Mary home. The child that she has is mine. And he's going to save his people from their sins. One person writes this, what, <clears throat> what makes it so great is who did what? Who worships the king of the Jews? Does Herod, the earthly king of the Jews? No. How about the Jewish scribes and chief priests? No. Do all the Jews in all, in all Jerusalem? No. But how about the Gentiles who are not from the promised land? Do they bow down in, in homage? Yes. They're in awe of him. Worship is a normal response to who God is. He's worthy of your praise. So what about us? So here's my question for you. Who are you? You can put that back up, Abigail. Who are you? Hostile, apathetic worshiper. You could, it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how much church background you have. This could be you. And I will say, I will say it in two ways. Before Christ, before you know him as Savior, I think you can, you can be hostile towards him. You don't really want a king. You can be apathetic, that you don't really care that he exists. And you can worship him when you become a Christian. But I think you do this as a Christian too, by the way. I think after you know Jesus, I think you can get to a place where you're hostile about God interrupting you. You're indifferent to him. But you could, you're called to worship him, to live in awe of who he is. So that's kind of the question for you, is who are you? Have you come to a place in your life where you recognize that Jesus Christ is the promised king, that you've recognized that he loved you enough, that he laid down his life for you? Is that your story? We can learn from, from Gentile magi on a proper response to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, um, I pray that you would help uh, your people to see who Jesus is. Uh, the fact that, that you contrast a, an immoral king who was put there by power and who ruled by force and, yeah, against the sun here, entering time and space to, to die for his people, who, uh, even as Christian said earlier, he, he left glory. He exchanged all the stuff. Philippians says it. Enters time and space to be obedient even to, unto death. Lord, I pray that every person in this room would come to a place they would see this, that they are loved by God, and that you are very, very humble. You are very good. And Lord God, that we would come to a place where we'd bow before you, kind of learning from the Magi of a proper response to who you are. And that you would give us awe and joy at the, the privilege of access. You've made a way. Ultimately, you would, this, this child would lay down his life. It's still coming. But Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes by your Spirit to see Jesus for who he is. The promised king, but not just a king. He's Emmanuel. He's God with us. So Lord, renew our minds. Help us to look at our schedules, our time, treasure, talents, anything else you've put in our care, and that we would just say, Lord God, um, what does it look like to honor you? What do you want? Where do you want me to go? 
And Father, that we would learn from a people, again, who weren't naturally from this, pe- this people, that the cost, it really wasn't a cost. They delighted at finding you. Father, make that us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.